work here. <laughs> I work here. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. I'm Crystal Champagne Norwood, executive producer of Atlantic Live, the team that brought this amazing festival to life. We've had an incredible two days, and now we're closing out the festival with a very special guest. For nearly four decades, Spike Lee has captured our attention. Whether showcasing history or weaving fictional tales, his film and television work has stopped us in our tracks made us think, and many times ponder a better world. Along the way, he's earned Oscar, Emmy, and BAFTA awards. Tonight, we'll hear about the experiences that have informed his work as a writer, director, producer, actor, and as both a creative and cultural force. It's an absolute honor to introduce Spike Lee in conversation with Atlantic contributing writer, Jamel Hill. Test and test. Can you turn it up, please? Test and test. All right. Before we go, I got to say one thing. It's Brooklyn in the house. Right. You can say it anywhere in the world and get a response from and that. And they will be in the house, too, right? Like, you don't just say it and get no response. Mm -hmm. They'll be in the house. Uh, Spike, I want to thank you so much for joining thank us you. here for this conversation. Um, I was very excited that he got the reference in the T-shirt. You should. <laughs> Y'all can't see it. What did you call it? Jesus Shuttlesworth and his two assistant coaches. Did you see her T-shirt? <laughs> yeah. It's only That's one of the. Got game. Yeah, it's only one of the greatest sports movies of all time. Jesus and the two assistant coaches. Or or two disciples. That was the other. Let's call them disciples. Two disciples. Um, Spike, you have made some of the most incredible films uh, in history, and certainly it's been a benchmark for many of us in this room who enjoy great storytelling, enjoy the visuals that you put on screen. So I want to start by asking you, as somebody who is four, four decades plus in doing this, what stories or elements of filmmaking excite you now versus what may have excited you 20 years ago? It's, it's still the same, because whether I'm doing documentaries or feature films, uh, short films, it's, still, it's all about a narrative, it's about storytelling. So my love and drive for storytelling is, is, is uh, not waning. Now, one of those stories you get an opportunity to tell, and I get an opportunity to tell with you, um, Spike Lee is directing Colin Kaepernick's documentary. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and what I, is your title? And I get the privilege of being executive producer, so. <laughs> learning at the, the foot of one of the greatest, um, which is definitely not a, a, any kind of career highlight ever I ever saw coming. Um, this, is, this is sort of a weird position, because I'm a journalist, but I'm also on this film, so there's only so much I can ask you about this, because frankly, I don't want y'all to know anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so th this is a bit tricky, but um, can you share, at the very least, of how you became involved with this project? Well, I got asked by Colin, and uh, even before that request came, I was supporting my brother, uh, this criminal, I think, that he still has not been allowed to play in the, the No Freedom League. <laughs> and it's been eight years now. There was uh, the John McClendon, Dean Smith, four corner offense where, you know, freeze, you know, and they just, NFL hopes that people just forget about them. So I don't, I don't call it white ball. I don't call it black ball, white ball. Mm -hmm. White balling. Mm -hmm. um, this week, I mean, for those of you that may not know, uh, so the Jets obviously lost Aaron Rodgers. 
four, the first four plays. Four plays into the, that's how long, that's how quickly it took for the Jets' hopes and dreams to be dashed. What, you know, I what mean, people in New York were fired up. They was, thought that we were going to the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. No, they definitely did. And we haven't been there since Joe Willie Namath. Since Joe Willie Namath. He guaranteed it. Guaranteed it. Took y'all to glory. Um, so their season was in quite uh, the turmoil. Zach Wilson's been playing since then. I'm just going to throw that out there. He's just been playing since then. And uh, they were in need, of course, of another quarterback. And uh, Colin wrote team owner, Jets team owner, Woody Johnson, a letter. Um, and that letter, with Colin's permission, J. Cole published that letter on his own social media feed. Um, what did you think of, of the letter? I thought the letter was very strategic. And... He said what people, he, he blew up that false narrative that, number one, I have to be a starter, or number two, I have a big contract. He said in this letter, I will be with the taxi squad. Yeah. I will work with. Yeah, he wanted to run the practice squad, which to give you guys some context in terms of explain, the Explain, explain always what the yeah, practice the, squad. Yeah, the, the practice squad, that's the squad that helps, obviously, the team get ready for the next opponent they will face. M the majority of, if not all, of the players on the practice squad do not have guaranteed contracts. They're not, by NFL standards, being paid a lot of money. I mean, it really is the grunt work of an NFL organization. So he's asking to lead that. This is a quarterback that's been to a Super Bowl, been to an NFC title game, was once one of the five best quarterbacks in the league, and he's now asking what would be the equivalent of me asking if I could be the janitor at the Atlantic. I mean, it is not, this is not brain surgery, this is not, you know, this is the low totem pole in, in terms of playing. You can't get any lower than that. Yeah, and so the Jets. And that's lower than a third string quarterback. No, it is, yeah, because most, most of the players that are on the practice squad were cut. And then they bring them back just to be, you know, practice squad players. So Colin wrote the letter, as, as you talked about how he combated some, some false narratives. Um, I know very well that that's a big part of what the documentary will be. So I'll ask you, um, when people do finally see it, and I know we're still working on it, what do you hope or how do you hope they feel about Colin? Well, when I do... A film, whether it's documentary or a narrative film, I put the information out there and people have to make their own minds. I, I've never really tried to say, you must feel this way about this or that. I let people make up their, I respect their intelligence. Some people, <laughs> more, more than I don't. And, and when you're an artist, you just put yourself out there and people respond the way they respond. Just, uh, this operated, you know, from the very beginning. Because the people who hate Colin, the people who burn his jerseys, give him death threats, I don't think this film is gonna, this document's gonna change their mind. Yeah, I mean, I know that um, it, it, that's kind of the way it works. It's like the people that he has, you know, so ticked off, like they're not going to watch and feel the level of empathy or compassion. Um, but it does seem like his opportunity to finally say things, you know, his way, which is a big, a big part of this, because he has been very quiet, you know? And so this will be an opportunity for people to actually hear from, from him and what he thinks of things. Well, I think that uh, in the long run, he's going to be on the right side of history, history, and all these other people who are calling everything, but, you know, at the end of that, they're going to be on the wrong side. Uh, one of the things I loved when they told me I was going to get this opportunity to sit with you is that, you know, for as much as I thought I knew about you, there were some things I did not know about you, Spike Lee. Well, you did research. 
I actually do that. <laughs> I, did, I did even more digging than before, because Spike has been a guest on my podcast, so this is not the first time we've been in conversation in an interview setting. But um, one of my favorite things that I learned about you, Spike, is that you actually hung up on Michael Jackson three times. Uh, uh, here's the story. <laughs> yeah, ex explain yourself. <laughs> Well, the phone rang. I asked who it is. Who is this? Who this be? This is Michael. <laughs> so Michael who? So, Spike is Michael Jackson. Hung up the phone. <laughs> phone rang again. Who is this? It's Michael. Hung up the phone. Called again. Spike, don't hang up the phone. This is Michael Jackson. So I didn't hang up the phone. Okay, so you heard him out. Well, how long into the conversation did it take to convince you it actually was Michael Jackson? I get a lot of fake phone calls, so, uh, and it's, it's not hard to imitate that voice. But let me tell you though, Mike, Mike, don't, Mike has, when he wants to get a point across, yeah, he puts some bass in it. That's when the baritone came out. <laughs> we, were shoot, we were shooting a scene for our, they don't really care about us, short film. Mike always said, Spike, don't call him. We're not making a music video. We call these, what I do is a sh short film. You just do the same thing. And Several times they'll mess up and say, music video? Spike, don't call it a music video anymore. <laughs> so we want to get his, Spike. He wants to get a point across, Spike. <laughs> Do not call them music videos anymore. How many times I have to tell you? Well, um, but that's not the end of the story. Oh, go right ahead. We got 49 minutes left. You're right. Give us the long version. We got we to gotta stretch it out. So the reason why Michael called me, he says, Spike, I'm coming out with uh, some new uh, uh, CDs called History. And the first CD is going to be Greatest Hits. And the second CD is going to be new music. And I want, I want you to fly out to LA and we're going to sit down and talk. I said, my daughter, my, my first child was born like three weeks ago. I can't go. You got to come to New York. He said, okay. I said, he said, where do you live? I said, New York. He said, where in New York? I said, Brooklyn. I said, okay. So a couple of days later, he showed up. We sat in my living room, he gave me this, this CD player, and he said, Spike, you have to pick one song. We're gonna play them all, all the way through. So we played the song, all, all, loved every single song. I think it was 12 songs. So you gotta make a choice now. I said, Mike, I like them all. Spike, you have to make a choice now. <laughs> So, I chose the song, Stranger in Moscow. He said, why you can't choose that song? I said, Michael, you asked me to choose one. Nah, nah, you got to choose. They don't really care about us. I said, why don't you just tell me? So, that's... So he's one of these individuals where they know what they want and they use, they make you think that you want what they want. Right, like it's your idea. <laughs> it was my idea. But that, I chose Stranger Moscow, which is, would turn out to be a great short film too. So at that time, Paul Simon had an album out called Rhythm of the Saints. And there's this uh, Brazilian 
drum group called All the Doom. So I said, Mike, let's go to Brazil and let's have All the Doom overdub the drum. That. So we went to Brazil, we came back to New York and did the, the prison version. But that was, uh, I mean, growing up, I wanted, I mean, my Afro, I had a Michael Jackson Afro coming up. I was born in 57, he was born in 58. So was Prince and, and Madonna, they all born uh, 58. Only two of us left, yeah. you know. So I, I've always worked with my brother, I also worked with my brother. Prince, and recently, we, you know, we have block parties in Brooklyn and we recently had a, a Prince Michael Jackson block party in, in Fort Greene. We had 30,000 30, people came. Yeah. Was anybody there? Yeah. You were there? Did you have a good time? <laughs> and, and from the very beginning, I told the crowd, this is not no versus thing. It's not Michael against Prince. Don't believe that bullshit. Those brothers <laughs> admired and loved each other. So I squashed that competition stuff from the beginning. We just celebrated, sang, danced. I mean, it was, it was a beautiful thing. Well, one thing I like about the, or loved about the doc you did on, on Michael Jackson was that I think for a long time, it reminded me of this way in terms of Peyton Manning and Tom Brady to speak in sports for a minute, where Peyton Manning for a, a large part of his rivalry with Brady got the, he got the perception of being the tactician, um, the better arm, of course, and like, you know, somebody who, um, you know, was more of a thinking quarterback than Tom Brady. And then, you know, ultimately we saw what Tom Brady's genius was, and I think Prince... Oh, can we hold up for a second? Because <laughs> when you start talking about Boston shit, hold on. <laughs> Fuck Boston. I know. Who I know. did... Oh, God, Who here beat we go. Tom here Brady. We... Oh, here we go. In the Super Bowl. Tw no, the New York Football Giants. And one Super Bowl, the Patriots undefeated. I was there. <laughs> Who did they lose to? They lost to the New York Football Giants. Thank you. You know what is so amazing to be about you New Yorkers when it comes? I know. Hey, they, they, they don't like us. We don't like them. So they, if Boston, New York, is just, that's just the way it is. That's the way it is. But I, Giants fans in particular hate the Patriots. I'm like, why? Y'all beat them twice on the biggest stage. Because they're from Boston. <laughs> Red Sox, Celtics, Brewers. Now let's let's go, let's 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 wine. We're we're supposedly in, supposedly in Chocolate City. <laughs> wow. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, Brooklyn identifies so did DC. Let's be honest. But let's go back to the glory years. Larry Bird versus Magic. The Celtic versus the Lakers. You know who Black America wanted? Oh, no, listen, I'm from Detroit, Spike. You know you ain't got to convince me to hate Also, Boston. what up, though? Another Black America's team. That's right. Georgetown, the Hoyas. Yeah, I thought, I thought Georgetown was Coach the HBCU. Coach Thompson, we had our starter jackets, Georgetown. I thought Georgetown and was now, the HBCU. And now, you know Black America's team now? Colorado. Colorado. It's Colorado. <laughs> That's our teams. And, and also, in 1947, who was Black America's team? The, it was the Jackie, Brooklyn Dodgers, 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 thank you very much. Jack, Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson, <laughs> followed by Roy Campanella, Don Nuka, Jim Gilliam, Sandy Am Sandy I Ambrose. knew I could depend on you, Spike, to bring it back to the People's Republic. The People's Republic of Brooklyn, New York. The, the People's very Republic of Brooklyn, New York. You made me forget my question, but no, you actually didn't. <laughs> Well, we I, got 42 minutes we left. Got, don't worry. We, we, we will not have a problem. Paul Warfield's number. Oh, you're right. We will not have a problem filling this time. So what I, where, where I was going with it was... Oh, me, who was 42? Um, 42. Jackie was 47. Uh, no, Jackie was 42. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was Jackie. He was 42. That's the, the only 42 I remember. What about the greatest reliever? Oh, it was Mariano Rivera? Yes. 42? Oh, Thank look you. at that. New York right. Yankees. You learn something new every Mariano. day. Mariano. We're going to always bring it back to New York. That's for sure. 
where I was going with that question when I made the Brady Manning um, uh, uh, comparison. I'm sorry, I got you. We, we went a little. Like, we we veered. It's okay. A little tangent. Um, where I was going with it is that what I loved about your documentary on um, Michael Jackson was that you. Sh Which one I did too? Oh, uh, I think it was This Is It, maybe? Yeah, This Is It. Okay. Um, you showed him as more of the, the tactician and the brain. And I feel like that's something he didn't get as much credit oh, as Kent, Prince got. I'm glad you said that. Because black genius is always overlooked. This guy, Jan Wiener, Rolling Stone. <laughs> not his greatest artists of all time, all white males, no women at all. And I bet everybody that he put in that category knows where they got their shit from. It wasn't Elvis, it wasn't Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, Chuck Berry. You know, that's where it comes from, and, and we we're talking about sports. Let's go back to those great Celtic Laker battles in the finals. I was watching CBS, Dick Stockton. Larry Bird was at the Boston Garden at 6 a.m. and shot 20,000 free throws. <laughs> like Kareem, I mean, for us, it's not our brains. We come out of the womb dunking. <laughs> like Jimmy the Greek said, we got that twitch shit, you know? <laughs> We're thoroughbreds. The we were, you know, on the, on the plantation. The, the slaves mating. It was slaves, love is blind. Bread apparently. like that. <laughs> According we to are Jimmy. never given. Not never, let me say never. Forget the never, never in Spanish, nunca. We don't get, intel we don't get credit for our intellect. Uh, look, I just want to say this first. Larry Bird can play. You ask anybody, they say Larry Bird was a brother. So but the, the sad thing was, Larry Bird was put in the position by white media to be the savior. That's not, Larry Bird not want that. He just wanted to bust your ass. Mm -hmm. He did not want to be positioned as the white savior to save the NBA. And we are not given the credit for intellect, a hard work, black genius. So this guy writes, says these guys of all the music, where's Stevie? Where's Miles Davis? Where's Duke? And we go on Aretha, we go, Jimmy Hendrix, go on and on and on, and we get looked over. And, and, and it's a shame, because they don't want to give it up. Elvis Presley did not invent rock and roll. <laughs> Jerry Lee Lewis, and how much, how many millions of dollars did Pat Boone make doing covers? <laughs> they won't give it up. Well, that's why I said that you're, the, what this is it. That's but, but get back to Michael. Yeah, yeah that's when you really, Michael I mean, is his genius. He's a genius. An absolute genius. And great work ethic. He will be at the Apollo Theater with his brothers and stand on the side of the stage and see James Brown perform in a puddle of sweat. Chuck Berry. He was there. He saw the work that you have to put in to develop your craft. And here's the thing, though. Here's the key. Listen to this, though. If you love what you're doing, that's not work. Can I repeat that? You can, you can repeat it. Yes. If you love what you're doing, it's not work. Well, let me give you another spikeism. I, I thought I'd get more applause than that. <laughs> yeah. What's up, DC? 
We do it. You got a new owner now for the for the team, so you should be happy. <laughs> and you got magic too. And you got magic, that's right. Give it up for magic. <laughs> Um, I want to ask you about another spikeism that you've said um, that I'd love for you to elaborate on. You, you said before, the last minute you stop learning should be the last breath of your life. How has that mentality served you in becoming a great filmmaker? Well, there's a story behind that. In, uh, in film school, in why you graduated film school, I got introduced to the, the I, became, I became aware of who Akira Kurosawa was. Even though I saw some of my films going up, I didn't know who directed that. I didn't know nothing about that. So Kurosawa was in New York during press for the film Ron, which uh, Francois Coppola and George Lucas ex executive produced. And in his article, this journalist asked him, you were considered one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Is there anything else you can learn about cinema? And Kurosawa said, there's a universe of cinema I still have yet to learn. He was like 80 something then. One of the world's greatest filmmakers. So when I read that in film school, he said that, then that, that just opened my eyes like, you should never speak to myself. Don't ever get in a position where you think you know it all and just be open to uh, different ideals, different thoughts. And so for the last 30 years, I've been teaching at NYU Graduate Film School where I'm a tenure professor there. And, and I've found that to be a good teacher, if you're not learning from your students, you're not teaching, I feel. So it has to be a, a flow back and forth. So my students for the last 30 years, you know, they've been keep, keeping me on my toes. <laughs> so what is your assessment, um, because you are still teaching, of young filmmakers today in terms of um, where their aspirations might be different, where they might be similar, or even how they approach filmmaking as opposed to maybe what was prevalent when you were a student? Well, I want to sound like those old knuckleheads like talking about uh, you know, generations after me. But they have it much easier because uh, students film, you can make a film on your phone now. You add on the laptop. So as technology has brought a democracy to filmmaking. Now, as I was in film school, all this shit wasn't around. We shot on film. Mm -hmm. We had to load, learn how to load a camera, 16 millimeter camera, how we edit on a steam deck. So, in, in, in my generation of, uh, in my generation of people went to film school, we went to film school to get the equipment, not for a degree, because the degree does not get you a job. When you, come, when you go to film school, when you, when you graduate, you want to have a film you directed, wrote or directed, the DPs want to have a film they shot, Editors want to have a film they edit. So this, this could show you, show somebody what you're capable of. Degree doesn't mean anything. So we had to go to film school. And two years ahead of me was Jim Jarmusch. So when this film hit Strange in Paradise, all of us knew that independent cinema would be the way. That, you know, if we were good enough, maybe we'd get to Hollywood eventually, but weren't gonna, for black folks, going to William Morris or some agency, some studio, your black ass is not working your way up from the mail room. Right. And, and that ain't happening. Mm -hmm. And early on, this is how devious this shit was. Early on, at the, my first film, She's, she's Gonna Have It was an independent film, and that the film was a hit. You know, studios started to uh, you want to have meetings with me. And so I go to these studios in LA and they always got a brother man at, at the gate. <laughs> so I go to these meetings, conference rooms, and I see all these brothers in the, in the meeting too with me. And I knew right away 
As soon as I leave, your black ass going back to the mail room. <laughs> so they'll bring up African American men from the mail room to be in the meetings with the rest of the studio executives. But I don't want to blow up their spots. I was going to, you know, blast in front of the, the white executives, but. And they were like kind of ashamed because they knew I knew. You know, they got the call, come up, Spike Lee's coming, make believe like you're uh, uh, executive here. <laughs> That's how devious that shit. I mean, they, I don't know, they can't do that now, but they did it back then. I was gonna say, do you feel like it's, for your students, it will be much easier for them to get a film made? Now? Yeah. But the technology, yeah. Yeah, okay. The technology, mm. the digital technology. How much do you still have to fight to get your films made that you want to do? Oh, I'm still fighting. You know, I had this epic film I want to do about the life of Joe Lewis, you know, that uh, epic based around the, the friendship between Max Schmeling, their two fights, and FDR Zinn and Eleanor Roosevelt, Hitler, Goebbels, Lena Horne, Sugar Ray Robinson, Muhammad Ali, because once uh, choirs is kept, you know, Ali was calling, he was calling Joe Louis, Uncle Tom, you know, a whole lot, which he later, you know, apologized for. But uh, I'm gonna get it done. And I co-wrote with Bud Schilberg, the great, great writer, Bud Schilberg, won an Oscar for On the Waterfront. He's in the Boxing Hall of Fame as a writer. And so we wrote this script together. So we talking Malcolm X level of going all in. Epic. 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 Speaking of uh, Malcolm X, will you and Denzel do another film together? You and Denzel what? Will you and Denzel, will we see you guys do another film together? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go Mo Better first. Right. Malcolm X, mm -hmm. he got game, yep. inside, inside man. Inside man. So, what? Uh, <laughs> Knock on wood? You, you, do you have something? Dynamic some, duo. You have some for him that you would want him to do? We're talking, and also, you can't leave out his son, John David Washington, right. who is who the you? star of, of Black Klansman. Black Klansman, correct. All right. Keep us posted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you said something very interesting about Jungle Fever, um, uh, which was extraordinary. And you said you thought Jungle Fever was your most misunderstood film. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel like it was misunderstood? Well, people, not everybody, they got hung up on the interracial relationship. But that film is really about the destruction of a crack on the black family. And if you, that, that performance by Samuel Jackson as Gator. Gator, because <laughs> I'm a cr 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 <laughs> But also, here's another story I got for you. Jungle Fever was Halle Berry's first film. And Halle Berry, had the, she had five auditions. Because the first four auditions, she was too fine to be a $3 crack hoe. <laughs> she wasn't believing them. She wasn't selling it. <laughs> so Robbie Reed, who cast the film, told her before he came in the fifth time, you cannot come in looking like the way you look. <laughs> and as I heard, I've never heard her say it, but I read, you know, she didn't take a bath for two weeks, something like that, and just came in. She got the part. And That's it, commitment. <laughs> it's commitment. I mean, that, what Sam and, and she did in that role, I mean, that was amazing. And got it, got it. last night I went to see the Broadway premiere of uh, Pearly Victorious, written by Ozzie Davis. They brought it back. We'll see. If you check it out, please go check out Broadway. And uh, Ozzie, Ozzie and, and Ruby, I mean, they're giants. The Giants. Uh, when you um, think about the, the 
totality of your career is... Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, go ahead. So, in Jungle Fever, (laughs) as you know, my beloved, Mm -hmm. music is a very important part of my film. So, Jungle Fever, two neighborhoods, Harlem and Bensonhurst. At that time, Bensonhurst was an Italian-American stronghood. And like, if you were black, you're black as it better not be in Bensonhurst when the sun sets. And so I wanted music to represent both neighborhoods. So I went to Stevie Warren and said, Stevie, I need some songs. I want you to write songs for Jungle Fever. He said, bet. Then I wanted Frank Sinatra's songs, three songs, Frank Sinatra. It was a very good year. Hello, young, hello, hello, young lovers. And I always forget the third song. So Frank's daughter, not Nancy, my boots are made for walking, but Tina. <laughs> Tina handled all his stuff. So I called up Tina, Tina, I need these three songs for Jungle Fever to represent Bensonhurst. And she got back to me, Spike, my father said, he's not giving you permission to use those songs. I said, why, what I do? My father feels you, you disrespected him. what I do? <laughs> In your film, Do the Right Thing, you burn this picture in Sal's famous pizzeria. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and me and Al, me and Pacino are tight, me and De Niro are tight. They've never said anything about their picture being burned. But Frank was like, nah. <laughs> Frank Sinatra's not having it. <laughs> he was not having it. So I kept calling Tina, Tina, Tina. Finally, she said, Spike, you have to stop calling me. I'll give you one more. Here's what I thought. You need to write my father, Frank Sinatra, a letter apologizing for burn his picture in Sal's famous pizzeria and do the right thing. So I wrote the letter, and it was handwritten. Ten pages. Ten pages? Ten. The hell was you saying? I had those songs. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> True story. And then, and then there's in there, so Frank Sinatra lived in Palm Springs, had his whole thing there, and every Friday, he would invite his people up from L.A. He'd fly them up to watch a film. So he would call the studio like Thursday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, call the studio, send me a 35, 35, millimeter, 35 millimeter print. And so one time, I don't know where I was, I ran into Pierce Bosman, and he told me that he was part of that group that watched films with uh, Mrs. Sinatra. And he said, we watched one week and we watched Malcolm X. And he said, he said, Frank loved that film. I'd he didn't tell me that, but I mean, Frank didn't tell me that. I'd love to know what I, that conversation was uh, after the movie. <laughs> but look, I mean, just look the people pay, we played with. Count Basie, yeah. Ella, uh, Sammy David Jr., uh, Quincy Jones. So he, you know, as musicians, respect, you know, game, recognize the game, musicians recognize musicians, same thing. Well, since we're strolling wonderfully down memory lane, um, I didn't realize that Do the Right Thing opened the same day as Batman. (laughs) I did not realize this. I don't know if you knew that. No, it wasn't. I thought it was Batman. No, it was Dracula. Dracula. Okay, I knew it was another big budget. I thought it was Batman. And what they were doing, the motherfuckers. <laughs> Black folks I didn't were even buying have to ask the tickets question. <laughs> for Malcolm X, but the money was going to the other film. How'd you uh, find that out? People would 
showing me their, their tickets. Doki doke. The three, Rudy Poot. The three card Marley. <laughs> three card Marley. <laughs> three card Marley, yeah. So who knows? I mean, that was not, I want to say on record now, that was not Francis Fork. That was not Francis Fork. He, that, he had nothing to do with it. Me and him are tight. This is just some other on the table shit. Did you ever ask them about? Francis? Yeah. No, I wouldn't do that. I know it wasn't him. Oh, no, not him. But did you ever ask the studio or take it up with anybody? Spike, that's not happening. We know who told you that. Well, um, since we're talking about do the right thing, what I wanted to I wanted to ask you about the the longevity of that film, the relevancy of that film. Um, film? Do the right thing. Oh. When you look at, especially in the last three or four years, everything that we've experienced as a country, as a people, with all the issues going on now. How much do you reflect on just how relevant Do the Right Thing is still today? Well, since you asked that question, my beloved, just call me Negro Damas. <laughs> so much, I wrote that script in 88, came out, we shot in 88, came out in 89. So much of that stuff. We were talking about gentrification, uh, global warming, even have Trump in the dialogue. There's a whole, I mean, stuff I mean, forgetting about. We also, if you look at, you watch that film even today, and you see Ray Rahim in that chokehold by yeah. NYP. PD, you, you can't think about a brother Floyd, Errol, Eric Gar. I mean, it's just like, like we saw that coming. Not to say we weren't being killed before, but right. these phones turned, turned the game around. You know, we were, we were able to record stuff. And plus, police have their stuff too when they. They turn it on. When they turn it on. <laughs> right. The, also, when they turn it off. Right. When they say go blue, when police, when some shit happens, jumps off, and they get the command go blue, <laughs> cameras are off. Um, She's Gotta Have It became a Netflix series. Are there any of your other films that you would like to see get a series treatment? Well, before we go TV, we gotta we're, we're, we gotta go to Broadway with School Days. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. And and, and uh, back, I mean, people were saying back in '88 when that film came out could be a musical. Uh, I got a DC store here. We had, it was 1988, and we had a party at the post office. Remember that? Was anybody? And it was a riot. <laughs> EU performed. Of course. I mean, it was like, it was, right, it was right during, right after school days came out. But that, the cops came, they, what is it now? The post office. Did they change something else? What? Yeah. But back then it was, I mean, they had the it was it was bedlam. <laughs> well Everybody you, was doing the butt too. <laughs> EU. I mean you could play go, that go. right now in this whole room uh, get up and do it. Um so school day is going to Broadway. Is that that's happening? We can, we can get excited. Yeah, we're working on a deal now. Ooh, all right. Oh. Now, you know they got the dollar bus from here to go to New York, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, I still would, I mean, okay, you're going to Broadway first, but I still would like to know, are there any of your other movies that you would like to see turned into a series? Or you think would make for a good series? I think that uh, I, I, I was very upset that Netflix canceled the she's gonna have it after after two 
after two seasons. Uh, no inside man, no. <laughs> it's a series, no? Is it? Right now, I think this stuff, if I do, if I do TV, you know, streaming, it's going to be, I don't want to recycle anything. Let it, let it be new. Um, a piece of advice that I saw you give for um, filmmakers was stay in your lane. So how have you managed to stay in your lane? How have you followed your own advice that you give to filmmakers? Knowing that I, know, I don't know everything. So even being a director, I mean, you got to know something about something, but I'm not going to tell the great Matty Labatique how to light something. I'll tell him how I want the light to look, but I'm not going to tell him what actual lights to use, stuff like that. So as a director, you have to know about cinematography, photography, dance, uh, literature, just a whole lot of things that you might not, might, might not be able to master them, but you gotta know something about them. Psychology, especially working with actors, but crazy as actors too. <laughs> well, I noticed too that, you, as you said earlier in our conversation, you didn't wanna be an experienced veteran hating on what young people are doing. And you have a very um, open collaborative process. Like you collaborate with a lot of other filmmakers and producers. Maybe it feels like more so at this stage in your career than you ever have. Um, how did that pivot happen and what have you learned from doing that? Well, you can't do it alone. You know, that one man gang, you know, doesn't work for a lot of people, especially not me. And I just enjoy working with talented people. You know, you can't, you can't make a film alone. I can't. Mm -hmm. um, you said that Joe Lewis was, that's the film right now that's burning inside of you that you want uh, to make. When you think about the types of films and projects, I'll just say projects overall, that you like to be involved with, what has to resonate with you in order for you to want to see it to completion? The story. Comes down to the story. Do I want to spend a year or more working on this project? So it comes down to what's, it's for me, it's for me. I'm, everything I say, Tonight, I'm not speaking for anybody else. I'm just speaking for myself. It's the story I want to tell that particular moment. <laughs> you make it sound so easy. But it's got to be elements of stories that you, that connect with you differently than others. I don't, I don't for me, it's not that deep. You know, it's, I, don't, I mean, if you want, if you look over the body of work, you know, some people might, be able to pick stuff out that there's a theme. But for me, if I think I've done a lot of different stuff. So it's not like I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again. So I have a lot of interest. Mm. Um, let's talk about another one of your short films. <laughs> uh, again, as part of the collection of things I did not know before, I did not know you were the director of Anita Baker's No One in the World, my Detroit homegirl. <laughs> She's from Detroit? She is from Detroit, one of our finest. So what's the backstory about how that came about? She got my number and said, I would like you to do this. And she sent me the song. I said, OK. Did it surprise you that so many musical artists wanted, to, wanted you as their director? They saw. <laughs> How I feel about music. I mean, Miles, oh, I got a funny, so Miles Davis called me. So he's getting ready to have this album coming out called Tutu. And so I got to meet him, and he said, Spike, I respect and love your father, so I'm not gonna call you a motherfucker. Because <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, he, he called you motherfucking a second, but 
affectionately or just? No. It, no, no, no. Okay. No. You know I was hoping. You know who's called me motherfucker affectionately? Who? Michael Jordan. You know, my guess would have been Sam Jackson, but. <laughs> no, 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 no. But Michael Jordan? Especially Nick Games. <laughs> Sit your ass down, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but he says it lovingly. 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 With affection, of course. Another thing, like, people, a lot of people don't know, Michael Jordan was born in Brooklyn. He was born in my neighborhood. Don't claim everybody. He was born in my neighborhood. Four if somebody went out of Brooklyn block, no, come like, on. Mike Tyson Brooklyn. was born. Michael Jordan and Mike Tyson were born in the same hospital. Okay. Come on, hospital in Brooklyn. And so, Mike, uh, so... I'm just a spike. Better stop talking that Brooklyn shit. <laughs> I'm from North Carolina. Yeah, your black guy was born in Brooklyn, so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'll allow it, I guess. I'll, I guess I'll let you, you get away from that. I mean, look, I'm from Michigan. They, they claim Serena Williams in Saginaw because she was born there. Right? I know, even though. I was I, born in Atlanta. So it, Grady well, Hospital. Yeah, and you went to. Uh, Great. You born in Grady? Yeah. yeah, but we moved <laughs> <laughs> at a very young age. I'm not hating. I cannot hating on Atlanta. I went to Morehouse, so I'm not hating on Atlanta. <laughs> you have some Morehouse folks here, by the way. Well, yeah. Oh, we, yeah. <laughs> we met already. <laughs> I thought was somebody, another brother here from the house. Uh, so Spike is. But what? My father went to Morehouse, and my grandfather went to Morehouse. My father was a freshman. Dr. Martin Luther King was a senior. And Martin Luther King III and I are classmates, class 79. Mm. And my mother went to Spelman, my grand went to Spelman. So that's where my parents and grandparents met oh, and, you got, have, and got married. You have deep love in Atlanta. I mean, everybody knows that. Well, my father's side was from Snow Hill, Alabama. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of Snow Hill, Alabama? I have not. It's near Selma. Oh, really? Okay, no, never heard of it. Um, so as you, you know, think about the, the totality of, of your career, um, do you feel successful? And I ask you that question just because I think sometimes when... How do you measure it? How, how do you measure success? Yeah, how are you measuring My beloved. It? No, I'm asking you how you measure it. That's why I said, do you, do you actually feel successful? My... Morehouse brother, John Wilson, his grandmother bought a house in Marlins Vineyard during the 50s. So I never even heard of Marlins Vineyard. He said, it was at the end of the semester, he said, look, why don't you come at the, at, at the school end, the spring semester? School's always said, why don't you come to Marlins Vineyard? I said, where's Marlins Vineyard? He said, it's an island. I said, like Coney Island? He said, no, it's not like Coney Island. <laughs> it's off the coast of Massachusetts. I said, okay. So I went to Marlins Vineyard. Never been there before. And I was like, God, if I ever make any money, I want to get a brownstone in Brooklyn, Fort Green. I want to get a house in Marlins Vineyard. I want to get season tickets to New York Knicks. <laughs> so, I'm successful. <laughs> I got my season ticket for the Knicks right after the Knicks drafted from Georgetown. Oh, wow. Patrick Ewing. <laughs> And so every year, I'll work my way down. Yeah, because I'm like, I don't think those were courtside then, right? <laughs> nah, I didn't start at courtside. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's good that you already, you, you feel that. Um, but do you, in terms of your hunger and desire in filmmaking. Still hungry. Still hungry. Still okay. hungry. So what's, what's left for you that you feel like you you need to accomplish. And it doesn't have to, I don't mean hardware. I, want, I, want I also want to do a musical a film too, besides the musical on, uh, on Broadway. So there's, there's so many things, uh, you know, I, I, I'm gonna do, you know, and in my class, 
when the student says the word try, I point to my TA. He picks a piece of paper and puts it down in front of him. It's a Yoda, Yoda. It's a picture of Yoda. And the quote. Was it no, uh, no try do? Yes. Something like that, yeah. So I put him on blast. <laughs> Professor Leo, I'm trying, uh, try, uh uh. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets placed in front of him on their desk. So we, that word is outlaw, try. Mm. Um, a lot of Yoda was a wise man. It, it was. Even though he was green. Or he was a, a he wise was, being, right? I nah, don't know. nah. He was a, he was a, a green brother. A green, <laughs> <laughs> it's a green brother. Wisdom, knowledge. He might be a 5% or 2%. A 5%. <laughs> no, today's, no, Yoda today's, definitely. Today's mathematics. You know today's man, Yoda mathematics? Yoda, he definitely gives Hotep. I'm, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> You know, they, you know, we're the guys and our sisters of the earth. How you doing, earth? <laughs> he was definitely on something different, for sure. He got the good strand. But anyway. Uh, they have five percenters in uh, D.C.? No? <laughs> Zero percent, huh? Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about the, the future of filmmaking before um, we come to a close. I know for a while, you know, there were directors, I think, Scorsese was one who really railed against the era of Marvel and the fact that Hollywood, uh, in general, there seems to be some level of dissatisfaction with people feeling like they only want to make tentpole movies. Um, how does, one, do you see that shift? Do you feel like that's accurate, an accurate depiction of where this industry is? Well, no one, this whole summer of Bob Oppenheimer. I mean, maybe they thought about Barbie, but a three plus film about the making of a nuclear bomb, that, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So, but, but there is a pref, I mean, there's so many the special effects hero, and I'm not, you know, killing him. I mean, Ryan Cooler did his thing with the Black Panther, and then many more other, you know, black characters. But I think the audience, I hope the audience wants more than just, you know, blockbuster films. Mm. I mean, if they were like Spike. We need you to direct Fast and Furious 27. <laughs> they Half a did, billy on the table. They just did 10. We know they, they're never stopping. You do know this, right? Like, people gonna show up. I'm not, I'm not the person for that. You wouldn't do it? I, I, they give you a half a billion dollars. They wouldn't ask budget. me, first of all. And, and it's It'd be not, a much different film. It's not just, it's not <laughs> something that, I'm, look, I'm not hating on it. You know, Vin Diesel is doing his thing. But it's... It's not my metier. That's a French word. Okay. Well, you know. It's not my thing. Yeah. Mm. No, I, I got you. I mean, I, I selfishly would love a shot of Vin Diesel and like The Rock on the floating dolly, but that's just a oh, double dolly <laughs> that's shot. <just> me. <laughs> mm. I'd love to see it. <laughs> but I've done stuff that people might not expect I would do, like Inside Man, which, uh, which sure. is a uh, you know a, a caper film. So. So there are genres, you know, that uh, are still have yet to explore. Um, when you talk to your students about the future of filmmaking, what messages or that, what encouraging messages do you try to relate to them? I tell my students that great shit was made for you were born. It's important. And some of those films are black and white. So in my class, I feel it was my duty to expose them to great films that have been made are necessarily from Hollywood. Some have subtitles. 
and just expand their knowledge of cinema outside of Hollywood. Mm. I mean, when they come to your class, what does their knowledge of Hollywood look like? Say it again? I said, when they come to your class, what, is your, what does their knowledge of Hollywood look like? <laughs> Everything's in the theater. Mm. And, and, you know, streaming. So I'm not going to show them something in my class when they could watch it at home or in, the, in their, uh, that's playing currently, you know, on, on a streamer, Netflix, anything else. Mm. Well, Spike, uh, as we wrap up here, I want to thank you for... Well, thank you. Generously giving us your time, telling wonderful stories. Thank you. You have had an incredible and amazing career that's still going. It is an honor for me to get an opportunity uh, to work with you. And um, I, I am just so excited whenever we were on set to just be in your presence. Because I felt like by uh, osmosis, osmosis, I was learning something. <laughs> right? Well, I want to I thank, so you thank you for your contribution to the Colin Kaepernick documentary we're still working on. And also for the work that you do that you tell the truth. And the Lord knows it was not easy. <laughs> Being a sister yeah. in the male-dominated, white male-dominated world of sports journalism. This is, this is correct. <laughs> so, Lord knows that was not easy. It is and, not. And, and you did not let anybody stop you from telling the truth as you see it, and your voice is needed because uh, a lot of people be lying. <laughs> Stone-faced lying. That's true. All right, well, I appreciate the kind words. I, uh, I won't clown you too bad because I wonder how Jordan would feel about you wearing them Knicks colors with his socks. I know they Jordans. <laughs> I know they Jordans, but... You know what I'm saying? Orange, orange or blue skies. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for coming thank out. And thank you back. for a wonderful festival. Please stay in your seats, actually. We have to let the talent exit, so if you guys could just hold just a quick moment for, you can stand, but um, please just stay inside for just a moment so we can let the talent exit. Um, thank you all so much for joining us for the 15th Annual Atlantic Festival. We are incredibly grateful for you all spending the ne um, these past two days with us, and we hope to see you again next year. Thank you. Thank you. Just wait right here. I'll let. I'll let you know when he is cleared. I'll come back.